Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. I'm Kat Fields-White. And I'm Bridget Myers. We're longtime farmer's market managers, educators, and consultants. Get ready to catch up on all things farmer's market pros with us. Today, we're chatting with Oceanside, California's Chef Sai the Sunfire Hot Sauce Guy. That's going to be fire. <laughs> Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by The Kitchen Door, helping farmer's market vendors locate the perfect commissary kitchen spaces for rent. Detailed listings of the equipment, pricing, and resources available at licensed kitchens in your area facilitate the perfect match. To find your kitchen and reserve your space, click the Kitchen Door logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com. Meet our resource partners March 4th through 6th at the Intense Conference in San Diego and get the help you need to make your market business less stressful and more profitable. This is the last week to save on pre-order pricing for this year's conference, so click the register button on the homepage at farmersmarketpros.com and save your seat today. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everybody. Today we are talking with Chef Saeed Samad, owner of Sunfire Hot Sauce based in Oceanside, California. Sunfire's stated mission is to light the fire within you. So let's talk to Chef Sai about what that means. Welcome to Tent Talk. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys so much for uh, having me on. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, uh, thank you for having me in your a wonderful farmer's market, the best in San Diego. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, um, couldn't be run by two better people. So thank oh. you, Kat. Thank you. Bridget, I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Sai. We wow. did not pay Sai to say that. We did not. That's all yeah. genuine from the heart. Well, from the heart. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're so glad to have you at our markets. And I love doing these episodes where we get to talk to some of our vendors. We do it once in a while because even though I see Sai multiple times every week, um, I always get to learn something new about you know how your business came to be. So I'm excited to talk to you today. And we're excited to Absolutely. have you on the podcast. Yeah. Let's do so it. let's jump into it. So if you want to just tell us a little bit about like your personal and business background and what you were doing before launching Sunfire Hot Sauce. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I'll get right into it. Um, personally, I'm from, uh, I'm from the East Coast. So I am uh, born and raised in um, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and that's where, where I kind of got my uh, my affinity for uh, the culinary and for food and, um, you know, being um, kind of in between the South and the North. Um, you know, where, where our both worlds meet, uh, I got, you know, there's a lot of good food over there. So, uh, you know, especially being an athlete, um, being the youngest and, uh, having two older brothers, you know, had to, had to make sure I got, I got my share, uh, of fixings, right. And, uh, had a lot of, um, older, uh, cousins as well that, you know, being the youngest of all that, um, I was really trying to just get whatever's uh scraps were left over so <laughs> uh, uh, but uh you know growing up you know I, I really did um have an affinity for for food uh my my mom's an artist my dad's a an herbalist um growing up so that's kind of where I get my um I, I would say um artist touch or craft touched with uh with the branding um because I've always had an eye for art um and then obviously um with my dad being an herbalist, being in being in health food stores, he he actually took me to a lot of farmers markets growing up, and a lot of farms in Maryland and um, Pennsylvania, you know, Virginia, Washington D.C. There's just a lot of culture out there to kind of uh, learn and grow um, into that world. Um, you know, the, the fresh farm to table movement, you know, the uh, the food co ops and all that. You know, when I was younger all that was pretty prevalent, um, in my household. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really strange to me, but, you know, to my friends, it was a little, little different. We were, we were a little different growing up, uh, uh, but which, you know, obviously those things kind of, uh, define your character, uh, as you get older. Um, and, um, when I decided, um, to jump into culinary it was years later after, you know, quite a few things after my sports career took a dive uh, and uh, I went to college in Pennsylvania. I went to massage school right after my first year in college. Um, but all the while, you know, my first job was like a dishwasher. Um, then I be came back to Baltimore and I was bussing tables at Applebee's and I was like, this is fun. You know, <laughs> I kind of 
kind of liked the, th- the fact that you we were I was around people. I could uh, kind of I was around food. I could kind of uh, make people happy, you know, because uh, I've always been more of a um, a cheery individual, more um, optimist, um, you know. And then um, as that kind of unfolded, uh, I said, you know, maybe I could try to make more money being a server. So I went down to the Inner Harbor in Maryland and worked at their, um, you know, few restaurants there. Started at the Planet Hollywood and. Um, and from there, went to you know a lot of the Baltimore restaurants like Phillips and McCormick and Schmick, and um, worked at some of those restaurants. Um, which you know now kind of they're kind of world famous with their crab cakes and seasonings on the shelves everywhere you can go. But and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, from there, you know, I, I saw an ad in the paper. Um, this is where we got me out to the West Coast, and it was for a cruise line, a Norwegian cruise line, and that that cruise line. Uh, had me um, train in Maryland, which was pretty cool because it was a Hawaii cruise line. Uh, and they had to bring everybody from around the country to Maryland to train. So I got lucky. I just took a bus uh, to Southern Maryland where they were, they were flying people in from Hawaii. And if you, if you failed the training, you had to find your way back. And I said, Oh, that won't be me. <laughs> Even I was close. Whoa. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, Hardcore. It, was, it was pretty intense. Yeah, it was intense. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they did it that way because they wanted to make sure that people, once they got on the ship, they would stay. And if they would abide by the rules. So the same rules applied at the training facility that it did uh, uh, on the ship. So um, I, I feel like I got lucky because, you know, for me, it was just a hop, skip and a jump down the road. And I, I was like, I'm going to Hawaii. Whether I, <laughs> you know, that was that was my main point. You know, it wasn't even about the work. It was like just that adventure of seeing a different culture. And, um, you know, when I got out, another lucky thing that was, uh, you know, I guess written in the stars for me was I never got on the ship. I actually worked from the hotels um, and I only worked uh, three days a week. So five days out of the week, I kind of got to explore the island uh, with some of the other oh, ship nice. chasers. That's what they called us. Um, and it, it was just a very exciting um, uh, time of my life. Um, and then from there, um that's my dog Mochi. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is named after you know a Hawaii treat, you know a Japanese <laughs> treat, Mochi. Uh, but yeah, we, we, you know I met, I met my wife there. Um, and after our, you know jump ship, obviously we met before I jump ship, um, and that was kind of the defining moment was to go, you know, all right, well we have someone to kind of spend this time with, and um, she was a traveling nurse, so she. She had way more money than I do, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, it was just kind of a, a good thing. Um, like I said, it was I felt like it was meant to be. Um, I love the culture. I love the food out there. I love the fact that they had the whole farm to table movement, uh, the music, the people, Um just the whole vibe was right for me. Um, and, and, you know, I never fit on the East coast. A lot of people thought I was from the West coast when I lived in Baltimore, mm. just because of the way I, t- I talked a lot more laid back. I'd be like, oh, you talk like a surfer, dude. Are you from the, are you from <laughs> California? No, <laughs> my, my parents are hippies. Uh, <laughs> You're so, very oh, you mellow. Know, that was kind of that mellow SoCal vibe. <laughs> very mellow. Yeah. Just funny when you say jump ship. That's like when you change jobs from a cruise line. It's kind of a literal yeah. jump and ship into something else. Uh-huh. Right, right. It, it really is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know that was it for me. Just when I when I did get off the, the ship, I was trying to figure out what it, what I should do. Um, and I had all this hospitality, back, front of the house experience. Um, I had a little bit of like expediting back of the house. I knew I could cook but I wasn't trained. Um, so, you know, after, you know, my wife and I, um, uh, decided to kind of, uh, dig, dig our feet into Hawaii, dig our toes into the sand, no pun intended, uh, a lot of pun intended, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we had a kid while, while we were there. We had both of our kids while we were there. And, um, I just decided after two years of living there, I had residency and I would be able to go to the culinary school for a lot cheaper. And it just made sense. Um, at the time, actually, the movie Ratatouille was out as well. Um, I, mean, I think a couple of years. <laughs> a lot of people think this is funny, but that movie motivated me more than anything. Where where they say anyone can cook, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, if, if the rat is saying that, I you know, 
<laughs> we all get our inspiration somewhere, okay? That's right. You never know where you get it from, right? <laughs> uh, he's very inspiring. So, very. Right. Oh, oh, Remy. Very, the movie's very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and, and it got me uh, got me motivated to go to culinary school. I t- uh, you know, I took the high road, uh, took all the best classes. I ended up um, um, being an honor student and graduating with honors, even with uh, having two newborns and Little did I know, you know, you, that doesn't mean anything when it comes to culinary. You have to get in those kitchens and prove yourself. So um, just started working um, long, you know, early mornings uh, to late nights um, and uh, was in Chinatown, uh, did um, Kona Brewing Company while I was there. Uh, and then I had a great opportunity. Well, we had a great opportunity to move uh, back to the mainland. But, you know, the biggest thing was to get back to family, you know, <laughs> we'd be closer, you know, six 6,000 miles away from Maryland was uh, not easy uh, to, to see see my friends and family. So uh, San Diego, 3,000 miles, a little closer, still <laughs> still on solid ground. Um, but I got the opportunity to, to work at the Ritz-Carlton. Um, after applying online, they, they, uh, they called me uh, the day I left Hawaii. And the Ritz-Carlton's in Dana Point, uh, I think that one's of a very long time, I would say, um, but it has one of the best culinary programs for any Ritz Carltons in the world, and uh, that was just a prime opportunity. But I got there, I got the interview, and uh, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a good interview. Uh, I didn't hear from them for quite a while, so I had to make other plans, obviously, with um, with kids, and and then you know, moving moving everything over here, um, San Diego. So I went and applied for Legoland uh, <laughs> just to see, you know, uh, you know, it was close. I had my kids were young, you know, I was like, oh, man, I'll be a rock star to my kids. And I, I landed that job. Um, but I got a call from the Ritz Carlton uh, the day I was in orientation for Legoland because <laughs> they they hired me pretty quick and I didn't know what to do. We had a break during our orientation and I called my brother-in-law who's from New York and, you know, New Yorkers usually give you a straight answer. And I go, man, I got a decision to make. The Ritz hired me, but I'm here at this orientation uh, for Legoland. And um, he said the very simple phrase, it's the Ritz, baby. And <laughs> I said, OK, you, you got me there. Very convincing. Your kids must have been crushed. They had a chance well, to they... have an in at Legoland. My kids definitely they, wish yeah. I worked at Legoland right now. Right. <laughs> You know, we we did end up getting uh, season passes years later, so they got their yeah, fix. There you go. That makes <laughs> you it know. up for them. <laughs> yeah. It was a good experience. All the while, I actually told them right then and there that I, I wouldn't be able to continue um, because, you know, I just, I got, you know, I just told them the truth and they were just like, well, you know, if anything changes. <laughs> uh, but it was a good experience, even though I was getting, going to get paid less at the Rift Carlton, it was more experience, more on your resume, more, you know, and, and. I'm I'm very thankful because I tell you that story because that's where I learned how to make salsa. Ah. And if I'm going to call myself the hot sauce guy, <laughs> you know, I had to be taught by some pretty good chefs, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, when I got to the Ritz-Carlton, they were actually trying to make their own hot sauce, I remember. Um, and it wasn't very good. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't last very long. Um, <laughs> so, but that got me thinking, oh, you can, you can literally just make your own hot sauce. Not, you know, I thought, you know, obviously, you know, being naive, being young, that wasn't something I was um, confident in or knew anything about uh, until I got there. Then I started seeing all these chefs make salsa in a hundred different ways. I was like, how, how many different ways can you make salsa? You know, boiling it, roasting it, whatever technique they were applying it. And because um, we had all the equipment you could possibly think of at the Ritz Carlton, obviously, you know, like like my brother-in-law said, it's the Ritz, baby. It's got, <laughs> they got everything, <laughs> you know, they had their own butcher. They had all the equipment, um, Beehive Kitchen, where it intertwined with baking and and, and the, uh, the IRD and um, you know, your, your, your steakhouse, your restaurant. So I got, I got the, the garbage. I got to work with all of those people and learn pretty quick. So that was sort of like a grad school when it comes to uh, culinary uh, just going there, um, getting paid very little, but learning a, a whole lot. And I left there because I didn't want to make that commute. It's about 40 minutes from Oceanside to Dana Point. But for me, I just, uh, I said, you know what, let me see what's, down here in San Diego. So I landed a job, Rancho Santa Fe at the inn, oh. um, 
and that from there I got the got, good opportunity to become uh, a cook one at, at stage dining and I went to La Jolla Country Day School to work at the private school um, and then that's where we had our hands on so much produce um, and the produce would spoil sometimes so sometimes we would we would have to you know either throw it out or just you know take a crap load of mangoes with us you know <laughs> you know just because if the breaks we would have you know Christmas break, we would have this big order. If the kids wouldn't go through, you know, produce fast enough, then what, what do we do with it for the next two weeks? Um, so, you know, that for me, I didn't like wasting food. It was always trying to experiment and see how I could save, save products. Um, one of the biggest thing was pickling, um, obviously making salsas or uh, using vinegar and sea salt to kind of cure things. Um, and that's where I kind of, stepped my foot into this fresh hot sauce idea. My neighbor grew a bunch of habaneros up the street for me. Uh, his daughter used to play with my daughters. And uh, one day he brought a couple pounds down, said, I grew these. I don't know what to do with them. You're the chef. <laughs> and I uh, had a bunch of mangoes. For, for, <laughs> so I ended up making that mango habanero hot sauce that I sell now. Um, and it was at my daughter's birthday party and we had it in our backyard. Um, and I put that out on the table thinking, oh, I don't know if anybody's going to eat this. It's pretty spicy. It was gone. Uh, and friends of mine were like, where did you get that? And um, I made that, man. You know, like that's something I just kind of whipped up. And they were like, you need to sell that. Both of the guys, too, were uh, one of them was in sales. And the other one was, uh, I think, hit a security or something. And they were convinced that that was the best habanero mango. And I, they convinced me to sell. <laughs> but it started off very slow in the beginning, just super small batches. How many farmer's market businesses have started because somebody said, oh, this is yummy. You should sell this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is the classic <laughs> intro to yeah. starting a food business. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, it's almost like, you know, if you if you don't listen to it, it's like the universe is telling you mm-hmm. through them, you know, like, and then more people would tell me, you know, like, you need to, you need to really consider selling this. And, you know, obviously job security is important um, when you have a family. So the biggest thing for me was just to continue to support or help support my family. Like I said, my my wife's a nurse, so she makes a a great deal of money and she helps the family um, tremendously. But for me, you know, being a food service guy, if you're not a restaurateur or, or, you know, own your own business or, you know, corporate chef making, you know, six figures, it's a very hard road to kind of earn your keep. So I just had this you know, idea that this could, this could work. Obviously it's not going to be like an overnight success, but because I heard so many people say that they like the flavor profile of the sauce, the fact that it is fresh, it's not a fermented sauce. Um, it kind of made me think, Oh, maybe, maybe this is different. And then when I had San Diego County tell me you need to keep it refrigerated because I've never seen anybody do this before. <laughs> That's where I went. Oh, okay. This is different. <laughs> uh, most hot sauces are fermented or if it's not a hot sauce, it's the salsa. You know, the shelf life is still only a month at the most. Um, but by making this with sea salt and then vinegars to preserve it naturally, it still has a shelf life, like a hot sauce where it can be outside of the refrigerator, but you know, obviously op- for optimal freshness we keep it refrigerated and keep the flavor profiles intact so that's where where i am with this business um as far as um its uniqueness but at the same time i feel like the hot sauce business has grown tremendously since i started and i'm starting to see other people get on that train so i'm like oh okay here we go uh (laughs) you know what is once uh you know the word is out there obviously it's not a secret anymore to kind of make flavorful hot sauce and focus more on the flavor and just not not just the heat element of it. Because uh, what I learned at the Ritz Carlton and through my travels is that the chili pepper has tremendous flavor and either um, whatever you do with it, you can change the profile of your of your cuisine. Doesn't necessarily make it spicy because there's there's mild chilies out there, but just that flavor profile of you know, either bell peppers or the habanero, obviously with the, the Chenin's, um peppers where they're fruity, but super spicy. So mm-hmm. there's so many, and I tapped into a world I didn't really realize uh, was so abundant when I did get into it. You know, obviously most people just think that Serrano jalapeno habanero, there are millions of peppers and I'm just kind of uh, touching the surface right now. Yeah. Obviously like the spiciest is the Reaper. That's one of my favorites. 
Um, but people, when people ask, have you ever had one? I go, yeah, I've had one, but I don't suggest it. <laughs> <'Cause> it's, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. It'll melt, melt your face off. <laughs> I had I one. Mean, it was a horrible mistake. Yeah, it's a horrible <laughs> mistake. Don't do it. Yeah. So you, don't I, do it. I mean, hot sauce is a booming category. Like we, as managers, mm. we see a lot of hot sauce applicants mm-hmm. actually nowadays, mm. way more than we did, you know, three to five years ago. It's really come up in the last yeah. few years, but you have some really unique flavor combinations. Mm-hmm. And I think- you know, when you're yeah. when you're applying to farmers markets and somebody seeing a lot of folks in a certain category, you have to really kind of dig in to differentiate your product to get your space in the markets. And I think your unique flavor combinations are what's doing that for you, plus your own personality and how well you do marketing and and things for your business. So, how many weekly farmers markets are you currently in? Thank you, Carol. <laughs> I'm in three. Okay, <laughs> okay. three. Yeah, Wednesdays. Uh, Saturday with you guys, <laughs> and then also um, Oceanside on Thursdays. Oh, nice. Um, I I uh, I had to leave Sundays open uh, because I had so much going on, but I was doing, you know, you guys' uh, down in, in Tula. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, obviously being a, a father and um, having kids, uh, well, one, my daughter just started high school, so... Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're doing the high school thing now, which is different. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yes, it is. Bridget, I know you talked about Bridget can you, you're testify. all over the place with your kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have kids similar ages. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Um, when you're mm-hmm. deciding which markets to do, obviously you're taking your own family schedule into account and how mm-hmm. much time you can spend at markets versus producing and all that. So it sounds like three a week. That that makes sense. That's a um, a reasonable kind of schedule and then mm-hmm. do you have a team helping you is it just you or is do you have a team of folks well it's just me as far as production like i i make all the sauces and bottle everything um i do have two people helping me with sales um and i have one person helping me with production she's kind of like production and sales um and they're sort of very i would say very part-time uh if not um volunteers um <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> so, but uh for the most part yeah when they do a market for me obviously you know they're helping me out tremendously because that gives me a day to sort of do other things whether it's producing or or you know i actually help my daughter's basketball team out i help coach um basketball for oceanside i have one other person helping me now um maya and she's looking into possibly another market where she can work that and i can kind of stay uh, with you guys on Saturdays, because trust me, mm-hmm. I do love coming down there every Saturday. <laughs> it's, a, it's a blessing. Yeah, as a farmer's market vendor, I think it's hard because if you're doing like just if you want to keep your market attendance kind of selective and don't want to jump into every mm-hmm. single market, usually like the weekend markets are busy and popular. And so if it's just you, if you want to double up on Saturday or Sunday, you have to kind of trust and bring in some team members to help mm-hmm. you do additional markets. So I know we've seen that with some other vendors, but um, yeah, I mean, I feel like you would just put a good kind of team together to help you expand. But since we're coming off like the holiday season, I know you had a really busy holiday season. How many events did you do around the holiday season with the with your hot sauce? Because I know you were oh, you were wow. in ours, but then you were at some other ones. Mm-hmm. It was busy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was a Maker's Arcade mm-hmm. uh, with San Diego Made. Um, they do about, I think they do three holiday markets. Um, the the one on the pier, yeah, the one at Julep, and one in Oceanside. Mm-hmm. So I did all three, and I had uh, had my, one of our workers uh, do that, um, do those three events. Yeah. Um, and then I did uh, the Bringle Terrace one in Vista. Uh, that was uh, Jingle Terrace Live. So it was the first year they had vendors out, I believe. Uh, but it was like seven days of makers. I only did one. I only did one just to see what it was like because it was literally 10 minutes from my house. Uh, yeah. So I did that one. And then because they were playing the same music over and over, you know, on a loop, I was like, I don't think I could do this seven <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally get it. So the annual events interest me because, you know, at our farmer's market, our priority is kind of putting food and farm stuff front and center. And mm-hmm. But we do find that non-food vendors do well mm-hmm. as an adjunct to that. So I'm curious when you're doing like a maker's market, maker's arcade or something, which is really sort of focused on non-food items, mm-hmm. gifts and, you know, Pinterest come to life and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. Yep. <laughs> How do you do with your product, you know, as a food item? Do you get a lot of demand for that at those kind of markets? Um, you know, it's it's funny because um, 
one of the people that was running it, um, that she never had a hot sauce vendor at like the Maker's Arcade. Um, and mm-hmm. I did it last year was the first time and, and it, it, it was a big success. So she was like, well, I guess you're my hot sauce guy now. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think they were looking in that direction <laughs> either. You know, obviously, like you said, it's like mm-hmm. Pinterest come to life when, it, you know, these booths, I think the booth space was five by nine. So it's a, a smaller booth space, oh. very boutique. Um, they want you to kind of build your booth space um, from, you know, from the ground up. Um, they, they don't really necessarily like the folding tables. <laughs> but for uh, for us, it was like, well, we have to do the tables, but we can build it on the table because we have the samples. And uh, I remember Christine coming to me earlier this year, they had a makers uh, for Mother's Day. And yeah. she goes, would you put MSG in your hot sauce? Because you had a line the whole day. I go, no, because oh, <laughs> it was busy, you know. And I was like, well, you know, it, it's it's good for me to be busy at these events. because they're, they're a lot more expensive, you know, as far as um, the vendor's fees. Uh, so, you know, you kind of want to make your money back and then some at those events. But at the same time, it's good exposure. Like they say, exposure mm-hmm. leads to expansion. So the more things you can do, uh, the more, you know, people see you out and, and and grinding and trying to get your product out, I think the better. So that makes a ton of sense. So in addition to what sales you're doing at those kind of events, you can also kind of push people back to your markets and mm-hmm. where they can find you all mm-hmm. year, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I always tell them, uh, you can find me here every Wednesday and Saturday, <laughs> you know, at the at at Little Italy. And that's that's a central location for most San Diegans. So, you know, that's why I love you guys' market. It's just perfect. Yeah. And you do a great job, I feel like, with all your marketing, no matter where you are. Your social media is really fantastic. It's so personal. It's clearly like you taking the videos. You are like selfie oh, king. I, You're taking <laughs> selfies you. with your customers, <laughs> with our market team, our staff. Like, it's so great. I feel like that really helps because... In this world of social media, when you're kind of promoting a brand, it can feel a little Mm -hmm. like fake sometimes if you're using like an outside company to do it. And so it's so nice. I like seeing the farmer's market vendors because they can make a personal touch about it. What has been kind of your reaction to social media from your customers? Do you feel like that really helps a lot when you're at the market and you're posting kind of live there daily? Do you think it helps bring those customers in? And how has the response been to that? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I actually just got a guy. I did a live video. I don't do live very often, but I did a live video where I was waxing the tops of my house because a friend of mine is like, you should show them how you do all this stuff. So I'm like, all right, maybe I'll maybe I'll just do this you know, I'll turn it on for this. And I got a couple of people come to uh, Little Italy on Saturdays. Like, oh, I watched your whole live. I just came down. <laughs> and I was like, oh, maybe I should do more of them. <laughs> you know, just because you, I did get a couple of customers and, you know, they actually bought quite a few sauces. Yeah. Um, but it does make it interesting. And that's what, like you said, I try to make it more personable mm-hmm. where it doesn't feel stale. I want, I want it to feel warm. Like I don't want to like do a lot of talking on mm-hmm. screen about myself. I just kind of want to show what's going on, yeah. um, show the natural reactions. Um, and I know like I, for me, I haven't, I haven't gotten a whole lot of traction on social media. Um, and that's okay. It's really yeah. just about putting it up there. Um, and trying to feed the beasts that where people can say, oh, okay, I've seen your stuff on social media. I know who you are, even though they might not comment or like it. Mm-hmm. They've seen it just because you, you're playing around, you're throwing up, um, you know, a, a reel of the week of, uh, you know, like, like when we did the, um, the tree lighting, mm-hmm. that was an awesome spectacle. There's so many people there, uh, took quite a few pictures in the morning as well. So I put it all together as one big day. Um, and that just got people, gets people's attention. Like, oh, you're down there all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I think it makes a difference. It's not really about like getting a ton of followers. And like, I think people are mm-hmm. like, just want to rack up those follows and those likes. I feel like it's making it like personal because then even if it's like 25 people looking at your Instagram, but those 25 people are going to connect with what you're showing and they appreciate like the behind the scenes, the waxing of the bottles, or when you're showing videos of customers like tasting your product. It's just really personal. And that, that, I mean, the bottom line is you want to make sales, right? And so I feel like those kind of things turn into sales because people feel connected to your product and they want to come to the market and find you. They want to talk to you. It looks cool as opposed to 
maybe you get 500 likes, but none of those people will ever show up. At Actually the show up. Right. Yeah. And, exactly. And the thing is, it, it makes you feel familiar to people. So especially you're at some big, busy markets. Mm-hmm. There's other hot sauce folks there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people wandering through. Mm-hmm. But as they wander through, when they glance at a booth and see somebody, oh, that guy looks familiar. I know him mm-hmm. because they've happened to, you mm-hmm. know, watch your video for a few seconds. But that gives them a feeling right. that they know you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just that connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm famous. You know? Yeah, you, you are, are famous. <laughs> <laughs> so famous. Hot sauce famous. Don't Market forget famous. about us. Right. Don't forget about the little people I'm, when you go I'm, on to your fame and glory. I'll never forget. <laughs> You've been in the markets a little while. So what are maybe some things that you might tell like newer market vendors getting into the market scene, like any sage advice for getting started or some things that maybe you wish you knew about? getting started as a farmer's market vendor? Oh, yeah, that's an excellent question Mm -hmm. um, because it never starts out the way you want it to. Um, And sometimes a lot of people jump into it thinking that that first market that was really successful, every market's going to be that way. Mm -hmm. Every market's not going to be that way. I mean, and it flip-flops, you know, from one week to the next. You know, you like on uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays, for example, um, one day, you know, Little Italy's better than Oceanside and and vice versa. It just flip-flops and you just never know. The biggest thing is consistency. I had a guy tell me at one of your markets, the biggest thing about these markets is they will be consistent. You have to be consistent. You know, the biggest thing is you being consistent and, and staying the same. And it's not about having those consistent numbers, just being that consistent personality that people can find every time they see you, you know, whether... Whether, you know, you're having a bad day or not, you can't bring it to the market with you. You know, you, you kind of have to just take in the vibe for what it is and kind of give out and stay true to what your brand is. You know, obviously, if I'm trying to light people up with some spice, I want to be, you know, upbeat. I want to be, you know, I can't be down. If I'm down too much, you know, obviously people are like, the sauce going to make me feel like that guy. <laughs> you, know, you really want people... To be inspired by flavors, taste, or just yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm totally like, I love that question because, you know, you can get discouraged uh, because you're having a slow day, mm-hmm. but you have to keep in mind it's not about that slow day. It's about the big picture and having more of a, a fifty foot view of your company as opposed to being three inches away from it saying, oh my God, today sucks. Maybe I should stop doing this. You know, Mm -hmm. every day is going to be different no matter what. And, you know, you got to prepare yourself. And it was was one thing I always say to uh, the kids that I coach, preparation removes all doubt. So if you're always preparing yourself, um, you won't have any doubt that one day it'll be successful, you know, staying ahead of the curb, you know, making your sauces, you know, and I'm I'm still in my experimental stage. I still I'm still making new sauces. You know, uh, every t- every time I see a new product, you know, I'm <laughs> just it's just it's fun for me. And if people can feel that that you're having fun doing it, they'll they'll buy in. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I saw a vendor in a market last night that was her menu looked like it might be worth trying, but she was standing at the front of her booth with her arms crossed, really scowling, really, I mean, like, mm, bad mm. face. And I thought, <laughs> threatening. Mm, I don't know. I don't think I want to pick up that vibe. No. So I'm going to pass right, on by exactly. that menu item. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's the thing about farmer's markets. It's not like being on a shelf at a grocery store. They're not just looking at your product. They're seeing if they feel like you're somebody you want, they want to form a relationship with, mm-hmm. you know, as, as being their mm-hmm. maker, whether it's, you know, hot sauce or teriyaki or, or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They come to the farmer's market, even though it's less convenient than maybe going to a grocery store with a big parking lot, because they want to know the people that feed them. And so yeah. your personality is so much a part of the, your product and your success. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such valuable advice, I feel like, for new vendors, too, that the consistency and just being there and not trying not to, like, take it personally or get discouraged if you're having a slow day. I think I see a lot of people, like, they'll come into even, like, our Saturday market. It's a big, mm-hmm. busy market. There's thousands of people there, and they won't do the sales that they expected to do on the first time that they're there. And it's like, well, you have to build that trust and connection. There's a lot of other vendors that are mm-hmm. selling amazing products at this market. So you can't. And so, But if they're there after a few weeks, they kind of build that up and then they feel better about it. But it's kind of keeping that in mind. Like, don't get discouraged right away. It can feel like a lot if you put a lot of work and effort into being there for the day. And yep. then maybe it doesn't turn out the way that you had a number in your mind. Um, but it always, you know, you'll have those really great days, too. So just finding that balance. And I think 
um, older, like vet, not older vendors, but vendors that have been with us for a, a longer, they have that perspective. And it's really helpful for new vendors coming in or new small businesses that are starting to do farmers markets, just keeping that in mind. And new market managers, too, as we grow markets, you know, it can feel discouraging, but just kind of keeping in mind, like, keep that long view going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have that same thing. It's the consistency that it is mm-hmm. what it's about. Because when you yeah. say, you know, that first day, you maybe do great sales because you're new. Mm-hmm. Markets are very much like that. The first day of a new market mm-hmm. is always crazy busy. And then if you're not prepared for the fact that the next yep. week you're going to drop like a rock because you're not the new thing in town anymore yeah. and then have yeah. to build up <laughs> by being there consistently and, and get, forming that trust with customers, we try to really mm-hmm. warn market managers that don't get discouraged. You absolutely will not be as busy on week two. Mm-hmm. You need to hang in there. You're going to build the following. And, you know, a year from now, it'll be amazing every week. But um, mm-hmm. you are absolutely right, Cy, that consistency is key to market success, whether you're on the yeah. vendor side or the manager side. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. reliability. And we both have to be consistent, right? The vendors and the farmers and the managers, we all are a team. Yeah. If we're if we're if one of us is not consistent, it doesn't work for the other one. So we all have to kind of be there and right. do our part with it. So yeah, that's why we appreciate need that synergy. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Teamwork <laughs> makes the dream work and all that. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sai, so wrapping up, <laughs> let's hear what's next for Sunfire Hot Sauce. It sounds like you've got a good handle on, you know, looking at that 360 degree view of your business and you're not just taking it one day at a time. You probably have an idea of what the what's going to happen on your path going forward. So what's next for Sunfire Hot Sauce and what's next for you? Oh, man, that's whew, that's <laughs> a, yeah, a lot. I got a lot. I, you a know, lot. I'm always speaking. <laughs> that's a lot. Since last year was the first year doing the farmer's markets full time under my belt. There's a lot that I can learn from last year. Um, I'm I'm pushing for that facility. You know, I always joke with people. I always go, I want to be like the Willy Wonka hot sauce. You know, where you come in, <laughs> you come into my manufacturing facility and it's totally interactive, but it's, you know, it's fun. It's tons of cool art. You know, it just, ca- it just captures you and you want to come back, you know. And it's it's about for me, it's about connecting um, every day with someone like I have stickers on my table that just came about because I want to connect with everybody. I want everybody to kind of like feel comfortable at the table, whether, you know, they don't like spicy, you know, well, here's a sticker to cheer up your day or something. It's like coming to the dentist office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're always smiling. They always want to keep a smile on your face. So it's just building that culture. And I think maybe I might be more two years out from that facility, but this year we'll be really grinding and trying to figure out what's best. Um, I just um, got into uh, a store, which is Wild West Mead and Vista. So they're selling the hot sauce out of there. So that's kind of like the first step into figuring out if I do want to sell it um, in stores, because my whole thing is direct to consumer, be more boutique, be your own manufacturer, you know, be that small soy sauce company from Japan that still brings in, you know, six, you know, six figures, uh, but the owner still wakes up and does it every day, you know, and that's, that's my mentality is not, not to pass it off or, you know, yeah, if someone comes through and offers me, you know, here's a million bucks for your company. I might take it, but I'll probably start a new company. <laughs> I was going to say, I bet you start something new with that money. I can just see it coming. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I just can't stop. You know. Yeah. I, you, I do not expect to see you stop. Mm-hmm. All right. And then, you know, the numbers are so different too. Direct to consumers to wholesale. I mean, and you probably figuring that out when yeah. you had to set your prices and things for Wild West Mead. That absolutely that can give you seven day a week exposure, but it's not necessarily bringing as much margin into you as the right. maker. Exactly, exactly. And that's kind of where I'm at. Where you know, if I have a family, I still need to bring in income. I still need to. Uh, be part of the bread winning team. Um, I need to definitely make more sense when it comes to owning your own business and not just throw money away and say, I need to get my product in here, 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 and here, here, here. You know, it's more of a, a very slow come up where, you know, if, if it fits, then, you know, let's try to, let's try to see if it'll work. But, it, you know, obviously if it doesn't fit, I'm not even going to try it on. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I can look at some certain things and know that it won't fit, you know, and then that's another way of saying it where, you know, some things you, you're, you're looking at it and you go, maybe I'll try that on just to see if it'll fit. And if it doesn't, you know, you just move on from there, just like a shoe, you know, you might like a pair of shoes in store, but you try them on and they just don't fit correctly. Mm-hmm. Or you you might see another pair of shoes that you're thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't like the way they look, but they look like they might fit. 
And a lot of times that's just how it is. You know, it, it might be the most comfortable shoe you've ever had, but you just initially, you did not like the way it looks. Um, but when you, when you wear them, it, it is just magical. And mm -hmm. sometimes <laughs> things fit that way. Um, and it just, you just kind of can't, that, that, that goes to say that you can't push everything away and deny things without giving them an initial try. Um, so my whole thing is you always want to at least see if it'll work. If it doesn't, obviously there's tons of other opportunities out there. Um, and there's no rush. There really isn't. You know, you wake up each day and feel blessed that you have the opportunity to do what you do um, and be in the position that you're in. Because uh, most people can't even press start, you know, just to get it off the ground. And they don't know how. Um, and for me, it just it came as I had a nice, lucrative uh, corporate chef job. The opportunity came, which kind of is the worst time because you're like, well, do I want to break off and do, do this and start this? But you kind of have to see it where you get the opportunity to learn how to how to operate a business, mm -hmm. uh, especially with a multi million dollar food service business. And you see how they operate. I mean, I got to meet the owners. We, you know, obviously Sage. Sage is not as big as Sodexo, and but they they do boutique private schools. So I got to see how they operated, learning their story. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, they they were almost out of business before they even started. So, you know, obviously reading, you know, reading into how a lot of businesses start, they, it's not going to be like an overnight success. It takes time. Um, even um, Nike, um, Shoe Dog, that's a great read. You know, he, he, he thought he was going to like fail a million times, <laughs> you know, and then 30 years later, you know, that's when it finally gets to a point where, you know, there's no looking back. And you know, that's where you just have to understand that it, your time will come if you just like, you know, th that word just keeps coming up. Just stay consistent, you know, just just keep doing what you know works. And um, eventually the big epiphany or the big deal will be made to um, prove yourself right. That, you know, you were in it for a long haul and, and you were in it for the right reasons. And it, and it eventually does become a success. So that's where I'm at, just kind of, you know, taking it day by day, like Dory says, another person you can learn from, <laughs> just keep swimming. Just, so. just keep saucing, <laughs> Chef. Just keep saucing. Just keep saucing. <laughs> That's <yeah>. right. <laughs> Looking forward to doing that with you. Yes. We have every faith in your future. I love yeah. that cat. Just keep saucing. Hey, that might be my new slogan, but you never know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to look for that sticker at your booth. I just love it. keep saucing. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today, Cy, and uh, we will see you at the market. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening today. This fiery episode has been supported by The Kitchen Door, helping farmers market vendors locate and schedule the perfect rental kitchen spaces in any area. Find your kitchen and reserve your space with help from The Kitchen Door. For more resources and tips to grow your business, meet us in San Diego or find us live online March 4th through 6th at the Intense Conference. Save on pre-order pricing for this year's conference when you register this week is the last week for pre-orders at FarmersMarketPros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk today. Please leave us a review on your podcast app or wherever you listen to Tent Talk. Let us and others know how you're enjoying the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Tent Talk. Connect with fellow Farmers Market folks in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros community. Follow us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros. And find online education and other resources on our website at FarmersMarketPros.com. Tent Talk is brought to you by Farmers Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Tent Talk is produced by Leandra Hayes with original music by David Mead. Tune in next week for another great episode.